Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Today, I'm going to be answering a reader question that I received in my inbox that has to do with frugality and debt freedom and spending. And I'm going to try to answer this question as best as I possibly can. So first, let me read the email that I got or Instagram message. I don't remember where I got it, but I copied it into my notes, which I do. So if you come up with an idea that you want me to do for my podcast, Anytime somebody sends me a long message about a podcast idea, I copy it into my iPhone notes and then I put it into my Trello board of podcast ideas. So they don't go unnoticed and I will eventually hopefully get to all of them. Some are just great ideas that I have to jump right on. So I received this message. I had an idea for your podcast mainly because it will help me. You've mentioned before that you're naturally frugal and the thing is I'm not at all, but I need to learn to be and I've been working on it but I could use advice from someone who's naturally good at it. So maybe at some point you could do a podcast on the things you and your husband do and did earlier in your marriage to avoid spending unnecessarily. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. First of all, it really truly does come naturally to me. And so it's hard for me to sometimes even realize the things that I do frugally that might even be noteworthy because it isn't something that I think about doing. I will say that I've noticed in the past couple years, as we've paid down all of our debt, we own our home outright, we don't have any outstanding debts at all, and therefore have a little bit more disposable income, if you will. I mean, no income's disposable, but we can now spend a lot more freely than we ever could, that I'm starting to understand the things that you can spend your money on that you maybe can or can't afford. So what I mean is, When I first lived in our Boone Street house, the one that we sold a year and a half ago, there were a lot of things about it that if I really got to thinking about it, I would like to change. The front porch was pretty ugly, didn't have much curb appeal, and we did do that later. The bathrooms, the tile was really ugly. I didn't like the light fixtures. Um, Maybe we would have added a built-in here, or you know, if I would have let my mind wander, There was probably about 150 things that I would change about that house, but I never did. I mean, we did eventually do some changes and we spent a little money, but we never did the kind of renovation that we're doing in this house. So what I'm saying is that once you feel like you have a little bit of money, you start finding a thousand ways to spend it. So maybe the root of frugality comes from the way that you see money and view how much you do or don't have of it. From the beginning. So when we moved into this house, I'm not going to say that I felt rich, but I did feel like, okay, we don't owe anybody anything. We have more with which to do things. I started noticing a billion different things that I wanted to change almost to where if I had an endless budget, we could just continuously spend it. I definitely have noticed maybe where people's money goes. It's just that you see everything that you could do as something you should do because you see how you could get the money. So maybe you understand that you could take out a little bit of a bigger loan whenever you buy your house and you could make the house perfect for how you want it. Whereas a naturally frugal person wouldn't even think about it. They would just buy the house and just live with it how it is, not even not even crossing their mind that, oh, I could change this certain thing. So the first step in frugality would be to understand money better. Maybe get on YouTube and listen to the Dave Ramsey podcast or on the podcast app. I just normally listen to his show on YouTube. But the things that are normal debts that we just consider to be necessary evils like car debt and student loan debt, If you start reframing how you think about those, you will feel a lot more broke than you probably do right now. (laughs) And if you feel a little bit more broke than you maybe perceived yourself to be before, you just won't think to buy another pair of shoes. You will say, you know, I already have a pair of shoes. You won't think I need to add some built-in cabinetry in my kitchen. You'll just think I can stash things in the pantry. The next thing I've done frugally that has come naturally to me is cook more simply. 
So I've never been a big coupon cutter. I've and probably used three coupons in my entire life. I don't focus so much on how I can get a certain brand name food cheap. Instead, I focus more on cheaper ingredients, which if anytime you make something that isn't processed, you aren't paying for that extra processing. So instead of, you know, I know you hear this recommendation a lot, but it's a good one. Go around the perimeter of the grocery store. I hardly ever find myself in the aisles. I look down the aisles whenever I'm at Kroger, which we used to have a Kroger. We don't have one anymore. But when I was in my old town, I think about this a lot when I was at Kroger. I hardly ever walk down those middle aisles. It just naturally, I just went around to the produce, the meat department, cheese, grains, things like that. All of those just ingredients, but not anything pre processed in any way is going to save you probably more money than even clipping coupons. Also, I find that sometimes people buy into these coupon things like Target will offer, if you spend $40, you get a $10 gift card. Well, if you go to Aldi, for example, I don't know if you have an Aldi where you live, you're going to save more than $10 on a $50 order anyway. It's just significantly cheaper than Target. So I would never do my grocery shopping at Target. Now, if I'm there and I need one thing, I'll do it. But if I need even more than three or four things, I'm definitely going to run by Aldi. I'm going to grab all of the ingredients, not a finished meal, but just the raw staples. And then that is how I save money on a grocery budget. Another thing with simple cooking is if you have a focus on meals that are just simple, protein, grains, vegetables, add a little salt, add some herbs. You won't find yourself as overwhelmed with meal planning and with the cooking process in general. And with that, you might find yourself eating out a lot less. Of course, that is about the biggest budget blow of any is eating out. It is significantly more expensive. Obviously, it's just a fun thing. Luke and I go out once a week now for our date nights. When we were getting out of debt, when our income was smaller, we never did stuff like that. We wouldn't even have considered it. I mean, maybe every once in a while we would go out to eat, but not on a regular basis. That would have totally blown the whole budget. Instead, for dates, we would have focused on you know putting the kids to bed early, making up some popcorn, watching a movie, things like that. I was just talking to someone recently, a couple of different friends actually, about how expensive things like furniture are. I mentioned this in my podcast with, I believe, Sarah and Deb, a couple of my guests, um, that we are looking for living room furniture. I've never in my life gone and picked out the furniture that I love. I bought a leather couch recently, which I talked more about, but I've never done the thing where you go and you buy, you know, the two chairs and the couch and the rug and the bedroom set, just the whole thing to furnish our house. But looking into that now, because I'm ready to do something like that for the living room, I'm really taking a long time to decide on it because I know that once I purchase that, I'm not going to want to change my mind. So I'm really going to think it through, but that is so expensive. So if you are buying a house and then you're going to go out and furnish it and not look on Facebook marketplace, not consider recovering couches or painting or something that's going to be able to get you your house furnished without a bunch of elbow grease then that is going to be one of those areas where you're going to completely blow the budget and you don't have to. One time a person told me that they bought a new house and it put them so much in debt, they were really stressed. And then when they got there, they realized that they had to hang curtains. And then that was another $600 on the credit card. And my jaw just dropped. A naturally frugal person would just think either one, I don't need curtains or two, I'll tack up some drop cloth because there's absolutely no way I'm going to put that on a credit card. So your idea of a need really changes whenever you're naturally frugal and you will not go into debt for any reason or consumer debt. Now I can understand a mortgage, of course, but consumer debt for any reason other than like a medical emergency, of course that's necessary. But anything that it's something you need, like maybe you need a couch or a chair or curtains, you will think of a different way to do it or just go without. In our old house, I remember it really shocking me how much curtains cost. And we lived in town, so we lived where people could definitely see us. We had a house right next to a public park. 
which this isn't really a great idea. I mean, obviously you're probably thinking I'm insane, but for the longest time we did not have curtains. And finally I decided that we should put up curtains. We just, you know, you turn off the light. You would try not to be in front of the windows, but I wasn't ready to splurge like that because there were other areas of the house that I wanted to fix up and paint and investing that much money in curtains wasn't something I want to do. Now, eventually I discovered drop cloth and realized that you can get curtains up for a really inexpensive price. But if your budget is so bare minimum, you just need to reconsider what it is that you actually need and really think through purchases before you make them. Instead of thinking, I need a new couch for this house, a naturally frugal person might run the numbers really quick. Like if you're working an hourly job, I remember when Luke was working an hourly job and I was considering making a purchase, I would see that couch or whatever it is that I might've been thinking about, which honestly, that was so far from my realm of even thinking I would do at the time. This probably wouldn't happen. What would have happened in my head is I would see it, see that it's you know, $1,800, really quickly do the math on how long that would take Luke to work. And then I thought about that. I was training my husband being at work 40 hours a week for three or four weeks just so that we could sit on something. And that just would blow my mind. I would also think about this a lot with cars. So there'd be people in my life who tell me that they really wanted to cut back on work or there was things that they really wanted to do, but they didn't have the budget for it. And I would look at their car and the job that they were working and think you're going into that job all day, into that office or whatever it is that you don't wanna do. So there's obviously nothing wrong with working, but these are people who were telling me that they didn't want to. And I felt like when I crunched the numbers, the whole time that they were in that office and the car was sitting in the parking lot, that they were in that office paying just for the car in the lot. And that is just not something I'm willing to trade my time or my husband's time or whoever the breadwinner might be for the family for. I would much rather just drive the junkiest car and have that time freedom or sit on a couch recovered in drop cloth or even the floor before I would want to work for something like that. Another thing I never paid for whenever I was a lot more frugal than I am now. And the natural frugal part of me definitely still comes out. Like I've been sitting on the idea of buying this certain living room furniture for probably a month now. It's been in my cart and I just can't pull the trigger on it. I totally have the cash for it, but it still just is like, oof. I mean, I just, it's so hard for me to want to spend money on something that seems trivial to me. Now I think that we'll enjoy it. It'll be great. Nothing wrong with that. But even it's still hard for the naturally frugal part of me to want to do. But another thing is anything monthly. So we sign up for things for a free trial and forget to cancel it. Or we sign up for things that we think we're going to use and we don't. Being really mindful of not doing that. Or, you know, in, back in the day, I would always set an alarm on my phone for whenever the subscription period or the trial period was up so I didn't find myself paying for it. But if I'm not going to use a monthly service, I'm not going to pay for it. And it takes a little bit of time and effort to cancel everything or to reevaluate what it is that you're paying for but being very conscious of what's coming in and out and thinking about the trading that amount of time for that thing will make things seem a little bit less necessary. So for the longest time, we just had Netflix. We didn't have Hulu or Amazon Prime and or definitely not cable. Now we have a few more of those, but not cable still. But I've always tried to keep all of my monthly subscriptions to a minimum. Now that I run a business, I have a bajillion monthly things because I have like an email service provider and website hosting, but that's all okay because it's for my business. But at the time, I don't think we carried hardly any. Another would be gym memberships. If your budget is tight, you can consider a lot of other ways to work out. Now, of course, some people find that working out does a lot for their mental health and you'll want to evaluate that because that's important. But for me, we would always just go on a bike ride or a jog or I'd push the kids around in the stroller and avoid that monthly fee. Another thing that a naturally frugal person does is always crunching the numbers and thinking about how money could be used in a more profitable way. So although I've been very naturally frugal, I am one to spend money pretty freely when it comes to things that will make me more money. So I've always been 
I've always been willing to invest my money in like mutual funds or business ideas. But when it comes to items, I'm never as willing to trade because I can see that the one will profit me more, whereas the other will just end up being something that you'll throw away. So after a while, you know, the kids will ruin the sofa. It's great to enjoy it, but you know, it's not forever. And so if you can afford it, great. But if it's going to put a strain on your budget, it's not something you'd want to do. I actually Googled how to be naturally frugal to get my mind thinking of some more ideas of things that I might have done and not realize that I've done and have missed. And number 10 on this list that I'm reading says replace the windows in your house. And I could not disagree with that one more on the note of crunching numbers and being a person who is not going to just buy something without thinking of the long-term impact. This has pretty much been proven by people over and over again that modern day windows are not made to last and the amount of money that you will save on your electric bill, it would take 20 plus years to pay off those windows. So this goes back to the always crunching the numbers. If you're not a naturally frugal person, that might be one of the core reasons is the numbers don't come as naturally to you. Another example of this would be, I see people driving out of their way to get cheaper gas. That doesn't make sense to me. Quickly, I'm seeing that it's five cents cheaper. I have a 18 gallon tank. I'm not even saving a dollar by driving out of my way. And I've always valued my time a lot more than money. Okay, so I'm still reading on this list just because, again, I don't know what are things that I do because I don't realize what other people necessarily do that they waste money on. But it says, wash your car yourself, cut your hair yourself. These are definitely things that I've done without really giving it much thought. Um, I would, would not really think about taking my car through a car wash. I actually have done that once in the last year and never before that. I'm pretty sure it was the first time I ever went through and the kids were like, what is this? But um, yeah, that is not something I would consider wasting money on. You could definitely do it yourself. Same with haircuts. I cut all my kids' hair. Luke usually just buzzes the boys' hair. I just cut the girls straight across. He buzzes his own. I'm the only person in the family who gets haircuts. I always have, but I have really thick hair. And so it just does not look good if we cut it ourselves. But those are easy ways to spend money. And of course, it's just a little bit here, a little bit there. And it, it really might not feel like it adds up to much but ultimately it will. And I think what happens is when people get really far into debt, really far into financial strains, they don't worry about the small things because it seems like there's absolutely no way they can crawl out of the hole anyway. So I'm so deep into this hole. I'm fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in debt from student loans and credit cards what's another 20 bucks on a car wash? Why not go get my nails done? It's just $30. Let's just go out to eat tonight because I mean, are we going to notice this considering we're already $60,000 into debt? I think that mindset is what people find difficult to break out of. And granted, one of the reasons why it's been easier for me to be more naturally frugal is that exact principle, is I never had debt, I never had it. And so it was always easy for me to see each dollar as a way to advance myself. I'm going to invest that dollar into something that'll make me more money in the future or a business, stock market, whatever. Whereas whenever you get down into the hole, it's hard to see the top and to pull yourself out of it. That's again why I recommend listening to Dave Ramsey because he talks about the baby steps. Some of his critics will, say that his plan is bad because he says to focus on the smallest debt first, regardless of the interest rate. And the reason for that is psychological rather than the numbers making sense, because of course it makes more sense numbers wise, just strictly going by the numbers to get rid of the debt first that has a 15% interest rate versus a 2% interest rate. Now that's an extreme example. Usually they're not that far apart, but his plan recognizes that one of the biggest problems with getting out of debt with frugality is the mindset. And so if you are able to build a little bit of momentum by paying off a debt, so say you have five different bills, you have a student loan, a car loan, a credit card that has $2,000 and another credit card that has $6,000. You could get that $2,000 one gone and you're used to paying all of those bills every month and it's like, oh, I gotta pay that bill and you feel so stuck. But say month three, 
you've paid off that $2,000 one because you've put all your extra money. So every time you wanted to spend $30 on your nails, you wanted to run through the car wash really quickly. You wanted to just go get a Starbucks. I know that's like the biggest example, but it's worth noting that if all of that money went towards that $2,000 debt, three months in, you have that one gone. Now you're excited because now instead of writing five checks, you're writing four checks and then you can move on up the ladder and attack the next one. The point of his baby steps is to focus on the mental place of debt and money and not as much the numbers because it matters. I grew up with parents who are naturally frugal. They never bought things they couldn't afford and they have nicer things now, but they can afford nicer things now. But as a kid, we always were driving the clunkers. So my friends, parents all had much nicer cars that they had car loans on and my parents had the ugliest cars. And actually a lot of my friends' parents also did the same thing. But there were kids at school who had much cooler cars and my parents would pull up in this like boxy brown, the thing on the ceiling and the inside was like falling down and stuff would fall in your hair. So I came from naturally frugal people and so it's easy for me to have this mindset and I understand that it very much is because I can observe the things that people spend their money on that I wouldn't even think about spending money on. And so by following a plan like that, you will start to get that mindset set for yourself even if you didn't grow up with it. Another thing I've really been pretty minimal about is clothing and shoes. I typically in each season have about three or four outfits that I wear, maybe two pairs of shoes. I wear them till they have holes in them and then I get a new quote unquote uniform the next year. It's always been easiest for me and I don't have to store a whole lot and then I don't have to get rid of clothing whenever it's out of season in a couple years. It's usually just so beat up by then anyway that I can move on to whatever style is currently in. When buying things that you do need, especially if they are big purchases, utilize Facebook Marketplace and garage sales. I still do this like crazy. I actually just a few weeks ago from when this podcast will come out, shared a recent antique hauls slash Facebook Marketplace hauls video where I show all the things that I've recently found. This is something I do re regularly. You can furnish your whole house, make it pretty. You don't even have to do without really. This day and age with Facebook Marketplace, you can profit off of the people who are going into major debt and constantly selling off their old stuff. You can go pick it up. And it might not be your dream living room or your dream kitchen that you are putting together, but it will be comfortable and it really can be very beautiful. It, it might even be your dream actually if you put in enough elbow grease, but think creatively and keep digging online and finding deals so that you don't have to be buying. Like the other day, I was wanting wood beds for my boy's bedroom. I Googled it looking just to see if, you know, I'm gonna save some time and not look on Facebook Marketplace. Let me just see what I can find. The wood beds twin size are like 500 to $1,000. I ended up finding them on Facebook Marketplace for $10 each. That kind of stuff happens all the time. Okay, another thing on this list because this one just, uh, if, you, if you're interested in reading the whole list, it's on moneycrashers.com. I will leave it down in the show notes below, but it says to don't play the lottery. And this is something I've heard people say that the lottery is just tax for people who are bad at math or something along those lines. If you start crunching numbers and you do the math, you will not play the lottery. You won't. You will understand that you should just put that couple dollars or whatever they cost these days into a retirement account. That's a much more sure way to prepare for the future. So on that note, I know this doesn't really have to do much with frugality, but it does with finances. Roth IRAs, those are the best deal. And if you can save up enough money after you've uh, gone through the baby steps, I believe it's baby step. I don't remember what baby step it is to invest. You can find that easily on Dave Ramsey. But after you've saved up a $1,000 emergency fund, after you've paid off all of your consumer debt, you should be investing for your future. And the first thing I would do is fully fund a Roth IRA. It's the best tax deal for investing for the future. 
It is where you put your money in after tax, it grows tax deferred and you pull it out tax free. So that is something to look into, but if you are going to even think about playing the lottery, just go ahead and save that money aside and put it into a Roth IRA. You'll be much better off. If you aren't naturally good at math, um, just put it into a calculator, crunch the numbers, don't play the lottery. Okay, so to sum it all up, <laughs> I feel like this is a little bit all over the place, but again, it's difficult for me to sometimes realize the things that when you are naturally something, so naturally frugal, the things that you don't spend your money on that other people might not consider to be not necessities. So to sum it up into three points, recognize a need versus a want. You don't need $600 worth of curtains. You just don't. You could put up trash bags over the window for all I care. But I would not, for any reason, finance for the next 10 years fabric over your windows. Next is to crunch the numbers. When you're thinking about buying something, if you work an hourly job and you make $20 an hour and you see something that is $1,800, imagine yourself going into work for 90 hours to pay for that thing. So if you hate your job, this is going to be especially motivating. Now, if you love your job, maybe you'll have to think more along the lines of what else you're trading for it. So you could go take that $1,800, put it into an investment calculator, which you can find online. I'm sure Dave Ramsey probably has one on his website and see what that $1,800 could be when you are 65 years old, if the market continues to average what it's averaged historically. Now you can't guarantee that but you have a much better bet that that money is gonna be worth a lot more than the old, decrepit, holy, dirty couch sitting in your living room that you're basically going to eventually sell for a hundred bucks on Craigslist or get rid of. So crunch the numbers. This is something I constantly think about when people are driving around a car that they spend $500 a month for. If you go put that into an investment calculator, you are going to cry and throw up when you realize what it could have been at retirement. Now, of course, if you're currently in that position and you are still relatively young, you have the power to change that. You can see that number and then go sell your car and still turn that around so that you have money at retirement. But um, yeah, just crunch the numbers. I think you'll really appreciate it if you do. I think you'll be really, really surprised at what seemingly insignificant purchase can end up turning into. I used to be in financial services whenever I was in college and we preached that you shouldn't buy whole life insurance, you should buy term and invest the difference. So without going too much on a rabbit trail, whole life insurance is where you have an insurance policy with an investment attached to it. Instead, take the money that you save and invest it and see where you end up. You'll end up with a much higher amount. So anything you do, car, Starbucks coffee, go and put it in an investment calculator and see what that weekly coffee is really costing you in the future. So recognizing a need versus want, crunching the numbers. And the third is adopt a frugal mindset and build momentum. So this is where I recommend going and checking out the Dave Ramsey baby steps, start getting the ball rolling so that you can feel good. Like you're doing something, get that snowball moving because it's very hard to move at first. Once it's going downhill, you're unstoppable. You can have all of your debt paid off. I've hardly ever listened to a Dave Ramsey call, which I've listened to a lot of them because I am a geek when it comes to this stuff. I do love money talk. It's just interesting to me. I've hardly ever heard someone call in and him be like, you know what, it's, you're done, I'm sorry. You, There's nothing I can do to help you. You are way too far gone. I don't know if I've ever heard that happen. He always has some kind of solution, some way that you can turn the whole ship around. Even if you grew up with people, with parents who were terrible with money, there is a way for you to start to see a little bit of success, build up a little bit of momentum, go a little bit faster, a little bit faster, and get to the point where you too are smart with your money and naturally frugal. It is a process. It'll be a lot harder for some people than others, and that's just the way life works. You know, there are things that are way harder for me than they are for you. That's just how it works, but it is very much possible. And I recommend to start building up that momentum. All right. I hope that this very scatterbrained episode was helpful for you and that I've encouraged you to start taking a little bit more control of your finances. We have been blessed immeasurably with being debt-free. When you're debt-free, 
you just don't have to worry in the same way that you do whenever you have debts. It's what allowed Luke to quit his job because yes, my blog was making money to support us, but I knew that if something went wrong a couple of months and we were a little bit down on our income, we don't owe anybody anything. So we could just get by. I wasn't worried that somebody's going to come take our house away because we own it. It's something worth shooting for. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you have not yet given me a five-star review in iTunes, I appreciate it so much. It really helps this podcast to grow and to increase in ratings. Just crossed over 500 reviews, and I'm so thankful for every single one of you that did that. It is helping to widen my audience and make it to where I can continue to do these episodes because they do quite frankly take a lot of time, but I've enjoyed pouring into them and I would be so thankful for a review. See you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Live podcast. Mm -hmm.